Does God give us a roadmap for this life? Are we to wander aimlessly without any direction? How could I know what His path is for me specifically? Bible prophecy shows us how God guides and protects His people through the end times. We will study His plan, His GPS, on how to find our way to Him. Please subscribe and click on the bell to be notified of all my upcoming videos. My name is Cami, and Unlocking Bible Prophecies starts now. Chaos is increasing worldwide. There were reports of an active shooter. Divides on politics and a worldwide pandemic are sweeping our globe. It feels like the end of the world. Are we headed into a new world order? What will happen next? Join international speaker Cami Utman on a journey to unlock Bible truth and uncover key answers to your Bible questions. In Cami's travels around the world, she has documented incredible miracles while facing life and death situations. Join us for Unlocking Bible Prophecies 2.0, which will demonstrate how God has given us guidelines to successfully navigate through what lies ahead. Together, we will see how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before and how we can have hope for the future. It's difficult to believe that tonight is our final night together of Unlocking Bible Prophecies. These past 14 days have been an exciting exploration of the Bible, where we have asked and answered some of life's toughest questions. Right now in the chat, let us know what new truth you learned from our time together in Unlocking Bible Prophecies. Now, if you've missed any programs or you are watching for the first time tonight, you can go to awr.org forward slash Bible for an archive of the entire series. You can watch and share them over and over. Since the topics build on each other, please be sure to try and watch them in order. And remember, we have a team of dedicated online Bible instructors eager to help you with any question you may have. Just click the link to connect with us. Plus, you can enroll in our online Bible school to continue your study by clicking to enroll for free. My prayer is that you would continue to study the Bible and draw closer and closer to Jesus. Today, I want to do something a little different and begin with a short video of a miraculous testimony of a man in Nazareth and how he stands up for God and how God stands up for him. Being born Muslim, Wiesen was taught to hate Christianity. So when his sister decided to become a Christian, he was sent by his family to kill her. But because of a miraculous dream from God, he decided to begin studying the Bible. He soon returned to Nazareth to share his new belief with his family. And his uncle, upon hearing this, became very angry and ordered his stoning. This happened over and over until finally his brother stepped in. Then his father advised Wiesem to flee the country. Years later, after his father and uncle died, Wiesem's mother invited him to return. He immediately saw an opportunity to share Jesus in Nazareth. So he decided to set up a center of influence where he used the Bible to teach English to his fellow people. We also gave Wiesem AWR God Pods, which he distributed among his community. Recently, though, things took a turn for the worse as the sons of his dead uncle found out what Wiesem was doing. They too had participated in his stoning many years before and now rallied a mob and went to Wiesem's house to attack him. Wiesem's wife, Audrey, heard the commotion downstairs and rushed out to see what was happening. She knew right away that Wiesem was in serious trouble and fell on her knees and began to pray. Wiesem's brothers rushed to protect him when he was hit with a metal rod, but then his own cousin pulled out his knife and stabbed Wiesem. But to his astonishment, the knife bent, leaving him unharmed. Wiesem's brother then picked up the bent knife and said, Try again to kill the man of God. As the mob retreated, they threatened, you will not know where or when, but we will kill you. 
Several months later, Weesom received a shocking phone call that these same two cousins had been killed while riding their motorcycle. It just reminds me that if God is for us, who can be against us? This miraculous event agitated the Muslim community so much that Weesom knew it was the perfect time to use AWR's cell phone evangelism. He immediately sought out someone to translate the sermons into Arabic. He found a man named Jamil who readily agreed to help. Jamil worked for days, sometimes late into the night, translating the Bible-based sermons. As he read, he was so greatly moved by the presentations that he felt compelled to share them with one of his friends from the Baptist Church. She was so amazed by the sermons that she shared them with her pastor, who was also impressed by what he read. He then sought out Weesom to preach at his church. Weesom presented at the Baptist Church, sharing Bible prophecy, our health message, and Ellen White's writings. Their hearts were so convicted that the pastor and almost his whole congregation made the decision to be baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And on a beautiful Sabbath day, we held a church service at the Jordan River. Then one by one, they entered into the water. Weesom had the joy of baptizing these precious souls with Elder Dwayne McKee. Isn't that an amazing testimony of God's power? Today, I want to offer something new for you, and that is the possibility to receive additional studies in prophecy right on your cell phone. Click the link below and you will have the opportunity to have powerful Bible teachings on prophecy delivered right to your phone. Just click the link. You know, the new start that Jesus makes available through baptism is really amazing. And I hope you have made that decision to follow through with Jesus in baptism. Everything we have studied has led to this moment today. What is God's final plan for this earth? And what is his final plan for you and me? We will see how God had a plan right from the very beginning of earth's history to protect and ultimately place a hedge around us, his beautiful bride, his true church, to bring her through to the final end. Let's pray, friends, and get right into the great controversy. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, King of our hearts, Lord, empty me of self and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Anoint my lips with only your words and have us become acutely aware of the times in which we live. Open our hearts and sharpen our minds, Lord, to your truth, so that we are ready for these last days. We know that you are protecting us, and we praise you in, in all of your glory, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I am so excited to share this particular message with you, because this is the very material that woke me up, that personally changed me and my life's direction from the pursuit of the world to the pursuit of heaven. Let's remember our theme. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, then it's not for me. Today, we are going to cover the entire story of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, from Genesis to Revelation. Are you ready? How many of you have ever juiced before? You take about 20 carrots and you juice it down to one little cup. We are going to do that to the Bible, the super juiced version. I'm going to need your mind to become like a movie screen because I want you to visualize this with me. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, begins our story with an angel named Lucifer who is described as a covering cherub now, to understand what a covering cherub is, we must go back to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 25, where the Bible describes a building. This building is important. It's called the sanctuary. God has instructed Moses to make this building, the sanctuary, for a reason. A reason for us today. Inside that sanctuary is the most holy place, where it is a reflection of God's throne room in heaven. In that throne room was something called the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of it sits the mercy seat. The mercy seat represents God's throne. 
That tells us something very important, that in heaven, the very foundation of God's throne is His law. You see, because the Ten Commandments are found inside the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says that on either side of the Ark were two angels that were called covering angels. That word cover means to defend or protect. That tells us a lot about Lucifer's job description when he was in heaven. Lucifer was supposed to protect and defend the law of God. He stood in the very presence of God. He was to guard the sanctity of the law, the foundation of God's government. But the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer was perfect in every way until iniquity or sin was found in him. The Word of God says that iniquity is sin and sin is what? The transgression or the breaking of the law. So Lucifer, who was supposed to be guarding the law of God, ends up turning against the law and thus the very first war broke out across heaven over the law of God. Satan hates the law. We have spent several evenings together studying this fact. The Bible tells us that Lucifer deceived a third of all the angels in heaven. How is that? Billions of angels. Did Lucifer say, hey, you holy angels, you want to be evil with me? No, that wouldn't be deception. He's slicker and more cunning than that. The book of Isaiah chapter 14 tells us that Lucifer proclaimed, I will be like the Most High. To be like the Most High means to be righteous or right doing as God is and holy like he is. Lucifer, he's actually saying, I can be holy like God without some law telling me how to do it. Have you ever heard that argument before? That we don't need the law in order to be like God? Friends, that is an argument of self-righteousness, thinking we can do all things without God. And that is what deceived a third of the angels of heaven. I hope you are following me in your mind's movie so far because this epic story is how our world began and shows the reason why our planet is in such turmoil. But this state is temporary as God has a masterful plan to save you and me. Next, the Bible tells me that Lucifer and his angels were cast out of heaven. Why is that? Why is it that Lucifer was not immediately judged? Have you ever questioned that? Have you ever asked yourself, why not then? The answer is simple, yet profound. Deuteronomy 19 verses 15 to 19 lays out a principle given to Moses and the children of Israel that whenever a controversy arose between two parties, there had to be a third party to discern between the two. That's only fair, right? Now let's take that very same principle back to our story in heaven. When Lucifer and his angels rebelled, how many sides are there in heaven? Two opposing sides. You have God and his holy angels, and you have Lucifer and his deceived angels. It is as though there is a stalemate. The devil is accusing God, for, and for God to sit over judgment of the devil at that point in time would have seemed unfair because the accused, God, would have also been the judge. In Ezekiel 28, verse 17, God casts out Lucifer saying, I am going to lay you before the kings that, you, that they may behold you. This term appears to be some kind of judgment, and you can picture Satan wondering, yeah, who are you gonna get to judge me, God? Don't you realize that all of heaven is polarized into two sides? Here's the question. Who would be the jury, that 
third party that God would use to judge Lucifer. Remember a few nights ago we studied about the millennium and judgment? It is the saved who are going over the books in heaven at this time that are the jury. Listen, there are three things that we need to know about jury selection. Number one, when a jury is selected, they like to choose people who have little or no firsthand knowledge of the crime, right? Guess what? Where was humanity when Lucifer rebelled? At this point, the human race had not even been created yet. So far, we humans qualify to be on that jury. Let's look at the second requirement to be a jury member. A juror must be a law-abiding citizen. Hmm. We know that Adam and Eve were created with the law of God written upon their hearts. So humans again qualify to be jury members. And number three, a juror must be able to discern between right and wrong and must not be swayed by public opinion. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 2 and 3 says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? We are the kings that God created, partially to serve as jurors. So men and women qualify on all three points to serve on this jury. So Lucifer sees this creation of man and wonders, Are these the ones that are to judge me? We'll see about that. Now let's think about this. When Satan finds out from God that someday he will be judged by the human race, what does he do next? Hmm. He seeks to bribe or sway us, the jury members, over to his side, his way of thinking and rebelling. He begins his lies in Eden at the tree. He had to con or convince humans to follow his instructions and not God's. When Satan beguiles Eve in the garden, does he say to Eve, Hmm, would you like to be evil? No, that would not have worked. That would have been too obvious. So instead, he says, Eve, let me show you how you can be just like God. Does that sound familiar? It's the same lie he used to convince a third of the angels in heaven to follow his ways in place of God. The old serpent led the human race to a, a warped concept of God's character from the very beginning. So unfortunately, our parents, Adam and Eve, chose to sin against God and they were disqualified from jury selection because they are no longer law-abiding citizens. This creates a very serious situation. So Jesus comes to the garden and gives them a promise that he would die for their sins so that they can have their choice of heaven again. Wow. We can ultimately know that the gospel was given to restore mankind to being sound jurors who know the difference between right and wrong and who are law-abiding citizens. I am so grateful to God for making a way for you and me to be reinstated so that we can return to the Garden of Paradise someday soon. Now let's fast forward our movie from Genesis down to the book of Exodus, where God is about to call a people out of captivity in Egypt. Who are they? Yes, the Israelites. Now listen, when Lucifer rebelled against God in heaven, he did not like God's way. Do you know what Psalm 77 verse 13 says? It reads, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So when Lucifer rebelled against God's sanctuary in heaven, he was really rebelling against God's way. God next calls on the children of Israel. He's getting ready to use them as his people who are to bring the message of salvation to the whole world. God gives the Israelites something special. Let's call it the blueprint or God's GPS, the gospel plan 
of salvation. God knew we would need a map, His GPS. He foresaw that we would wander around lost and need guidance to get back home. The way is back to Him, friends. So God lovingly looks down on Israel and He says, I'm going to give you a special gift. And in that gift is the way. I want to use you Israelites to give this map, this special GPS, to the whole world. He wants to give the gospel plan of salvation to the whole world through the Israelites. We can begin to understand and imagine how Satan must have felt rage once he saw a replica of God's throne room in heaven, God's sanctuary, being built by the Israelites down here on earth in the wilderness. Because now humans would have the opportunity to understand God's plan of salvation. Satan must have been rounding up his army of fallen angels saying, so this is the thing to guide all people to salvation? Well, we hate it. And we're gonna annihilate God's plan to save this world. We will destroy the people who possess God's truth. We cannot allow this truth to, get, to take over the world. So you must be asking, what is this blueprint? How is this the path to salvation? We are going to take a picture and we're gonna study this picture on the screen. Let's have a bird's eye view of the sanctuary as if we are flying over it. You see the outer court, you come to two articles of furniture. Now what is fascinating is the real meaning of each furniture piece personally for you and me. First we see the altar of sacrifice where animals were sacrificed. What does that represent? The sacrifice of who? Christ Jesus. Next, you have the laver. That is where the priest would wash their hands and feet. And what does that symbolize in the gospel? Baptism. Let's make our way inside the holy place now. And you see a table of showbread. It represents the word of God, the bread of life. Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Next, you turn and you see you have the altar of incense, which represents our prayers. And then you see the seven branch candlestick representing the Holy Spirit or our witness to others through the Spirit of God. Friends, you see, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. We must shine brightly for Jesus. It is all about your witness, friends. Now, Let's make our way inside the most holy place. You see the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments inside. Friends, this is a layout of our blueprint. So how is it that this sanctuary is God's gospel plan? If you look closely at this picture and trace around the outer edges of the articles of furniture, do you know what you would find? Yes, a cross. Can you imagine? Thousands of years before Jesus comes upon the scene, the sanctuary is prophesied, that the sanctuary prophesied that Christ would die upon a cross for our sins. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. Also, when you look at the sanctuary, you will find something else very interesting because in each place where an article of furniture is, there Christ was wounded. A nail in the left hand, a nail in the right hand, a crown of thorns upon his head. He died of a broken heart, nails in his crossed feet, even to the point where he was pierced, pierced in his side and blood and water came out. You see, God delivers his people through this plan, his path, over and over again. Let's take the children of Israel, for example. 
In Exodus 12, they're being led out of captivity. The first thing God told them to do was make a sacrifice and put the blood on the doorposts. And what article of furniture does this represent? The altar of sacrifice. Now we'll go to Exodus 14. They are on their way to freedom, and Pharaoh says, Wait, what have I done? I've changed my mind. Go get them. Bring them back. What does God do? He opens the Red Sea. And what does that symbolize? The laver, baptism. After they get to the other side of the Red Sea in Exodus 16, guess what happens? They cry, we're hungry. And guess what God does for his people? He rains down manna, bread from heaven, representing the table of showbread. Next, in Exodus 19, God says to them, You are my peculiar treasure. You are my light to the world, my people that I'm going to use to bring salvation to the earth, which in essence is God bringing them to the seven-branch candlestick. God says to Moses, I want you to tell my people to spend three days preparing themselves to meet with me in heart preparation, in prayer, which symbolizes the altar of incense. Why should they prepare their hearts? Because what happens in Exodus 20? That's right, God comes down and speaks the Ten Commandments. Now let's look at the life of Jesus and how it matches the pattern of the sanctuary. Jesus is born in a manger among animals. You might say he was born on the altar of sacrifice. He was baptized at the age of 30. That's the laver. He is then led up into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan. And that first temptation is for him to turn the stone, stones into bread. The second temptation, throw yourself down from this cliff and offer up a presumptuous prayer to God. Third temptation, I know you came for your people, your seven-branch candlestick. Bow down, and I'll give you your people. But Jesus refuses Satan, and Jesus overcomes all three temptations and goes on to preach the law combined with mercy. Or how about this? The same pattern. Let's look at the New Testament books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all deal with the sacrifice of Christ. The next book, which is Acts, is about baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the laver. Making our way through the sanctuary, we see also then the next book of Romans through Jude all talk about the importance of Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. And then Revelation brings us into the very throne room of God, the most holy place. Friends, we ought to know this blueprint it's the plan of salvation. So now I know that when I want to be saved, there is a process. Romans 10 verse 9 says, I must first accept who? Christ. And if I genuinely fall in love with Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, I will then be what? Baptized. Now do we stop here? Is there more to God's path beyond baptism? Yes, there is. Next, if I'm genuinely baptized and I'm following Christ, I will then want to study and claim God's word. I will pray to God to deepen our relationship and I will witness to others about his good love. While on God's pathway to salvation, guess where you are ultimately led to? That's right. John 14 verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, the devil is angry at this plan of salvation, of course. The entire Old Testament is really about how the devil is trying to destroy the people who possess the blueprint and to destroy the blueprint itself. Imagine it like this. The blueprint is a football, and God gives this football to Israel, and he says, take it down the field. So Israel begins running down the field, but they choose to rebel against God, and instead, they get so stubborn that God allows them to go their own way, off into falling into Babylonian captivity. What happens next? We are introduced into the first of three prophecies in the book of Daniel. The first prophecy is a 70-week prophecy. What is this prophecy all about? 
we'll keep it simple for this illustration, friends. The prophecy is God saying to Israel, the one to whom the sanctuary points will come in 70 weeks. If you are not ready to receive him, and if you continue in your rebellion, I will take the blueprint from you and I will give it to somebody else. Well, guess what happens? Israel is not ready when Jesus comes and Israel rejects Christ. You know what happens when he dies? The veil in the sanctuary is torn in two, top to bottom, signifying the end of the earthly blueprint. Jesus, after his resurrection, ascends to heaven in a heavenly sanctuary, and the blueprint, or that ball, is now taken from literal Israel and given to spiritual Israel. Guess what? We've just gone through the entire Old Testament for this evening. Whew, halfway. God gives Israel the gift of tongues so that they can take the message of a heavenly sanctuary and a heavenly high priest into all the world. Off spiritual Israel goes, down the field. Nothing can stop them. And Satan says, mm, I must block these guys, these incessant Christians. So what does Satan do? First, he raises up literal Israel to attack spiritual Israel. And then he raises up literal Rome to attack spiritual Israel. But Satan finds that every time a Christian dies, it is working against him because their blood is like seed. It only multiplies. More determined than ever, Satan says, now I've really got to change my tactic. And this introduces us into the second of three timeline prophecies in the book of Daniel. The prophecy of the 1260 years. As we studied, this prophecy simply states that there would rise a power called a little horn. This beast power would seek to cast down God's blueprint. How does the devil use this little horn power, this counterfeit spiritual power, to cast down God's sanctuary? Let's put our blueprint back up on the screen. You see, the devil is the master of counterfeit. He manipulates the masses with his popular substitutions. Remember friends, for every Bible truth, Satan has his counterfeit. So what happened during the Dark Ages, that 1260 year period that we studied? Well, the Church of the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church, cast down God's truths that were being taught by God's sanctuary. What do I mean? The altar of sacrifice, which represented Christ's sacrifice, was cast down and replaced with a teaching called penance. People were told that Christ's sacrifice is not enough to pay for your sin, so you must pay penance. The effectiveness of Christ's suffering, his sacrifice, was cast down and a counterfeit was taught in its place. Now what about the laver, which represents baptism? The Church of the Dark Ages said, we are going to substitute infant sprinkling in the place of genuine baptism by immersion, which calls for confession and wholehearted repentance. Not only did they do that, but they went up into the holy place to the table of showbread, which represents the word of God, and declared, you can't understand the word of God for yourself. Only the priest can explain it to you. In this way, they promoted that the traditions of the church are more important than the word of God. Not only did they do that, history shows, but they reached up into the altar of incense, which represents prayer and claimed, you cannot pray directly to God. You have to go through a priest. In fact, they even created their own two compartment room divided by a curtain with a man sitting on the place of God hearing the confessions of other men. This is mimicking God's most holy place, friends. These counterfeit teachings put the light right out of the church, thus creating the Dark Ages. Finally, the Roman Catholic Church went up into the most holy place and took God's law, 
his Ten Commandments and just messed with them. We spent much time looking at these details together in this series. They took the Fourth Commandment, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and cast it down and put in its place a first-day worship. Satan is determined to mess with God's GPS. He wants you lost. Shall we despair? What's God going to do now? Well, there was one more prophecy called the 2300 year prophecy. And this prophecy stated that at the end of the 2300 years, which would end in 1844, friends, this is a deeper study, which I recommend you ask our Bible instructors about, but I, I need it to make this point. In this 2300 year time period, the sanctuary would be cleansed or restored. You see, Daniel 8.14 says that it shall be restored to its rightful state, back to God's way. So watch this. You know what our God begins to do over a period of 500 years? He begins to restore every truth that had been cast down during the Dark Ages. Let's return to our last blueprint slide showing the truths being cast down. Watch closely what our God does. There was a man by the name of John Wycliffe who comes upon earth scene in the 1300s. What does God have Wycliffe do? He translates the Bible into the language of the common people, thus restoring the table of showbread. He is why each of us have a Bible to read in our own language today. Friends, if I was living in the 1300s, I would have been following John Wycliffe all around. Now in the 1400s, a man by the name of Martin Luther is born. What a man of God. Martin Luther begins the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. And through him, God restores the truth that it is Christ Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that pays for our sins, not penance, so if I was living in that time, I know I would have been a Lutheran. Praise God for the Lutheran movement. Amen? In the 1500s, a man named John Calvin comes upon the scene, the founder of the Presbyterian movement. John Calvin had a special burden for prayer. He said, we could go directly to the throne of God for ourselves. And John Calvin effectively restores the altar of incense. I pray that during this time, I would have been a Presbyterian. Do you see, friends, that God's people continue to accept any new truth or new light that God reveals to them? Fantastic. In the 1600s, there was a man named John Smith, who upon studying his Bible, he said, wait a minute, you can't baptize by infant sprinkling. The Bible clearly says you have to be fully submerged. Confess and repent of your sins before you are baptized. This effectively restored the laver. He became a founder of the Baptist movement. And friends, if I was living in the 1600s, I definitely would have been a Baptist. In the 1700s, a man by the name of John Wesley enters the scene. And John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement. He has a special burden for the, the gospel getting out into the whole world. And God, through him, effectively restores the seven-branch candlestick. Let your light so shine. If I was living in the 1700s, I pray I would have been a Methodist. Friends, one more article of furniture is left to be restored. Hmm, what movement would God call upon the scene in the 1800s to restore the final piece of missing truth? What movement restores the Ark of the Covenant? Seventh-day Adventism restores the Ten Commandments found inside the Ark of the Covenant including the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God's chosen day, 
His Sabbath is our seal. We study this, friends. It's his mark on you to be saved. We saw that in the presentation, the authentic seal. God has called you for such a time as this. He wants you to know his Bible truth. We are told in the Bible in Revelation 7 that we must have the seal of the living God to make it through the end time. We must be sealed for heaven, friends. We studied how the first angel in Revelation 14 takes the gospel into the whole world. This gospel could not have been preached during the Dark Ages because God's truths have been taken away and cast down, taken away from the people. By 1844, all articles of truth had been restored by God. So who are the Seventh-day Adventists? Our heritage is Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. We just kept taking all these restored truths by God, His blueprint, in its entirety, and moving it down the timeline of Earth's history. In 1988, there was a football game. Cal State versus Stanford. It was called The Play. There were four seconds left on the clock. Cal State was down by one point. The band had already begun to celebrate. All Stanford had to do was kick the ball off. They figured the game was over. I mean, what are the odds of the other team returning the ball and winning? So they kick the ball off, and down the field the ball goes. Cal State gets the ball, and they begin running. As the first guy begins running, someone tackles him. But before he hits the ground, he tosses the ball to his teammate. On the other side of the field, the band is already marching in celebration. People are on their feet screaming. The second guy gets the ball and begins running. The commentators are getting excited and they're raising their voices because the second guy gets tackled. But before he hits the ground, he passes the ball off. The third guy the same thing. The fourth guy, the same thing. The fifth guy, the same thing. The sixth guy catches the ball, everybody's screaming and are on their feet, and that sixth guy runs into the end zone. Listen to me, friends. The devil's band is on the field right now. They think the game is over. They think that we commandment-keeping Christians, those that believe the Bible fully, Seventh-day Adventists, are a beaten people. Friends, God wants us to finish the game. Let's wrap it up and go home. There is no time left on the clock. 1844 was the last time prophecy in the Bible. Friends, study that out for yourself. In my mind, I see the angels on their feet or on their wings. They're cheering for us. Come on, take it into the end time, the end zone. And off God's people go down the field. The first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message. It's all their friends. The third angel's message is nothing more than the message of Noah. Get into the ark. Bible truth. Get into the ark before it's too late. Why? Because a seal of God is found inside the ark. The Bible says those who are outside the ark will be marked for death. We read in Revelation 15 and 16 that the angels with the seven last plagues are seen coming out of the most holy place. Why? Because those who receive the plagues are those who ignored and rejected what is found inside the most holy place. Our message is to get into the ark. For those who choose to get into the ark and receive God's seal, do we need to fear the impending seven last plagues? As always, scripture has our answer. Psalms 91, a favorite chapter of mine, Verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is a promise of protection, friends. Claim it. Verse 10, No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come nigh or near your dwelling. Not one plague. Just like the Israelites. Do you believe God's promises? Our God throughout all of earth's history has kept his every promise to us. He is so ready to have his character vindicated. He promises that your bread and water will be sure. I trust him. In Isaiah 43, 1 and 5, God says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Fear not, for I am with you. Let's put that to memory, friends, because we are going to need it probably sooner than we think. Someday the only treasure that you may own it's the only possession that no one can take from you, is what you have stored in your mind. May it be of saving value. So hallelujah, Jesus comes. He cracks the sky. The Bible is so clear that every eye shall see him coming. We've studied how the righteous dead in their graves are raised to meet him in the air. This is no secret, friends. Everyone sees it happening. Don't be fooled. We then studied how the righteous go to heaven for the millennium or jury duty. When the books were opened back in 1844, it was simply this. In Revelation 12.10, we see Satan was accusing God's people. And the reason God opened the books is not to try and condemn you or me, but to prove Satan a liar. So when Satan threatens, well, but he did this or but she did that, God affirms, heaven's book records they repented of them all. So they are white as snow. They are my children. The books contain key evidence to save you, not to destroy you. Now, when the judgment begins at the millennium, the righteous get to see the books, and they too join the chorus of angels. Just and true are thy ways, O God. You judge righteously. And at the end of the millennium, God comes down from heaven and resurrects the wicked dead on earth as we studied. And at that time, this planet will turn into the biggest movie theater the world has ever seen. We are told in panoramic view, everyone will watch this movie. It's Earth's final movie. Now this is reality TV. This is no make-believe. I don't want the lost, the wicked, pointing at me and saying, you saw this movie and you didn't tell me about it? You told me about the latest Hollywood blockbuster, but you didn't tell me about the movie, the story that counted? The great controversy? Now comes the time when God must destroy the wicked. But understand the reason God uses fire. It's not because he's mad but because he is love. You see, God is described as consuming fire in Hebrews 12, 29. And the Song of Solomon tells us that consuming love burns like a fire. Have you ever been in love before? You felt that fire? That's what God is like. He is fire. 2 Kings six seventeen describes his chariots are a fire. His city's a city of fire. His throne is a throne of fire. And he wants us to be able to dwell in that fire and not be consumed. Friends, do you want to get to the very presence of God? You better be fireproof. Just like when God showed Moses the burning bush, how is it this bush burns but is not consumed? God was trying to show Moses 
This is my ideal for humanity. He wants us to be able to stand in His presence like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were thrown in that fire and were not consumed. Listen to me. It's the righteous that burn forever with the glory of God. The wicked are not fireproof, and they burn up, fully consumed. God will not allow them into heaven, because heaven would be hell for them. Do you see how the devil flips it? In terrific majesty, God, with those great big arms, stretches out and embraces the wicked one last time. All the wicked in one giant hug. And in that embrace, the wicked feel the love that they have rejected. It is then that every knee will bow down and all will declare, Just and true are thy ways, O God. There is a unanimous decision to destroy the wicked. And then God renews planet Earth to his original plan, a perfect garden paradise. And the Bible says in Isaiah 66, 23, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me. You see, friends, we'll be keeping the Sabbath in heaven for eternity. This is Earth's final movie, friends. God has called you for such a time as this. Stop sitting on the fence. Satan wants you to believe your doubts and doubt your beliefs. No matter what you have done, Jesus has more than enough mercy to cover you. Jesus will finish what he started in you long ago as a child. Just ask him. All he needs is permission and he will come in to fill your life. Our God is able. He is more than capable to keep his every promise. I wish I could better describe him to you because he's indescribable, even incomprehensible. He's invincible and he's irresistible. And when you fall in love with him, you cannot get him out of your mind and he will never let go of your hand. You can't outlive him and you cannot live without him. Death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him. The tomb is empty, friends. Our Redeemer lives and he wants you with him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, King of the universe, I pray that each of us stand firmly in your truth, that we remain alert to the snares of Satan, that we claim your promises of protection and provision during these last days. You are mighty and merciful, and you keep protecting and providing when we don't deserve it. You see us as your diamonds in the rough, and you make us shine like new. Praise you, Jesus. You are the King of Kings. I especially pray right now for my friends who have been studying with me through this series. You know the heart of each one. Send your Holy Spirit in a special way and help them to walk in your truth so that we all meet together in heaven all oh, that day. May we proclaim you to the whole world. I pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Friends, the great controversy teaches us that God has a GPS map for you. He continues to do everything he can to assure your salvation. God has a plan for this world, and most importantly, he has a plan for you. Tonight, I just want to ask you one more time. Will you commit yourself totally to Jesus? Will you follow all of God's truth? Are you willing to be a commandment-keeping Christian and join his remnant, the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Out of your love for him, if you are thinking about baptism, commit tonight, friend. We'd love to see you make that commitment 
just click the provided link to connect with us. I want to thank each of you for entrusting me with your time in studying these Bible topics together over the last 14 days. I do hope and pray that you will follow Jesus all the days of your life. Again, thank you so much for watching Unlocking Bible Prophecies. May God bless you abundantly. Choose God's way. Good night, friends. I'm excited to continue sharing with you on Facebook as well as on my Unlocking Bible Prophecies YouTube channel. Please subscribe and click the notification bell so you won't miss any of my upcoming presentations. And most importantly, I want to encourage you right now to go to awr.org forward slash more, M-O-R-E, to sign up for free online Bible studies and mentorship groups. We want to stay connected with you and help you grow more in Christ from wherever you may be watching. Some of you have shared with me that you are thinking about being baptized. We want to help you prepare for your baptism. That is so thrilling and it just warms my heart. So again, go to awr.org forward slash M-O-R-E. May the Lord richly bless you as you grow in Him. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more Bible truth, I invite you to subscribe below. Also, click here to watch one of my favorite videos. And click here, top left, to watch this series in full. God bless you.